Today on Inside the Issues, I speak to Jeremy Kinsman on the topic of his new book, A Diplomat's Handbook for Democracy Development Support. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. I, I'm Dr. Andrew Thompson, an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week, we're joined by an expert in global governance, international affairs, or in international public policy here to the studio uh, at the Centre for International Governance Innovation. Joining me today is Jeremy Kinsman. Uh, Mr. Kinsman is former Canadian ambassador to Italy, to the United Kingdom, to Russia, and to the European Union. He currently holds uh, visiting appointment positions at the University of California, Berkeley, and at Ryerson University in Toronto. And he's here to talk about his new book, A Diplomat's Handbook for Democracy Development Support, which is in its third edition, and it's published by the Centre for International Governance Innovation, along in partnership with the Community for Democracies. So, Mr. Kinsman, every week we, on Inside the Issues, we bring an expert on international affairs, global governance, or international public policy to the studio here, in, uh, here at CG. And so welcome, it's great to have you here. Well, thank you, Andrew. I'm glad to be here at the famous CG. I wonder if we could start um, by just uh, getting your thoughts on the state of democracy around the world in 2013. Well, there are two ways, I guess, to measure it, Andrew. You can measure it by breadth. That's the Freedom House membership. You know, who uh, are, what are the trends uh, toward more countries that are considered to be free or mostly free, or you consider it by depth. Um, by depth, you'd have to look at the United States and Canada and uh, Europe and Chile and ask their citizens, are they happy with their democracies? And they're not. And so on the depth side, you could say that some of our democratic institutions and behavioral reflexes are uh, being frustrated. Uh, the breadth side, uh, Freedom House reports that this is the first time ever that for seven years in a row, the number of countries that have moved from the free side of the ledger to the not so free is greater than those going the other way. And so they call it a uh, democracy recession. I think that's simplistic. I mean, I understand their methodology and where uh, they're going. I actually think that in terms of aspiration, uh, what we're seeing right now is a remarkable explosion in the insistence of people all over the world for greater agency over the decisions affecting their own lives. And that's what the Arab Spring was. Uh, now, as some people are saying the fact that the Arab Spring hasn't created perfect democracies after kicking out dictators uh, is a deeply negative and discouraging thing. It's certainly not encouraging, but it's understandable objectively because it takes time to build democracy. But what the Arab Spring showed uh, emphatically and importantly is that there's no region in the world that is immune to these sort of universal global aspirations. And, and, and I, I want to underline, there's no religion in the world that's immune. The uh, trope had been out there for years that somehow uh, uh, Arab countries, Arab Muslim countries, were somehow unable to absorb democracy. They were not suited to it. And that, that, I think, has been demonstrably uh, dismissed. They absolutely uh, do insist on the same measures of dignity and transparency and agency as other places. Right. Now, we put a lot of stock on elections. And you make it very clear in the book that elections are important, but they are not the be-all and end-all. And you advocate this idea of inclusive pluralism. Can you explain that concept? and? Uh, and then also explain why it's so hard to develop. Elections were the be-all and end-all in the early 90s when after 1989 the wall fell. We thought, let them have their free elections and everything will be fine. Uh, we didn't realize that uh, it's much more important to think about what's going to happen after the elections. The elections produce a, an electoral winner. But how is the winner going to behave? 
Is a winner going to behave as a winner and treat everybody else as losers? All societies are pluralistic, more or less. I mean, some are vividly pluralistic, ethnically or by sect or by race or by language. But all societies are culturally pluralistic. They're culturally and economically uh, pluralistic. And uh, the point of uh, effective democracy is uh, for it to be inclusive, for people to see themselves reflected in the institutions, either by surrogates who are participating and, in a sense, representing them, but also by the extent to which the country is reaching out to all its citizens. And uh, so uh, that doesn't come easily. That capacity of, uh, of building uh, trust among people is something really that has to be learned. And it's not something that uh, is developed under dictatorships. Uh, it is a function of a product of civil society, really, more than anything. And um, those authoritarian governments which did not permit uh, civil society essentially stifled it. So when Libya loses the dictator, it has no civil society. It has no experience in the sorts of compromises and, and give and take habits that are developed under a civil society. It's, it's unable for groups to accommodate themselves to other groups. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt got elected, but it had no capacity to be inclusive and to reach out the scholars I uh, hang out with uh, write a lot about pacting, uh, old orders and new orders. To some extent, it's what these truth and reconciliation commissions are that we've seen in South Africa or Chile or uh, Rwanda. Uh, it's to exchange truth so you can get over it uh, and reconciliation uh, for an ability of the society to go, go onwards without recrimination. Um, very seldom has a new incoming order completely overturned an outgoing order. In most of the early revolutions in what we call the Third Way after 1974, I think about post-Franco or the, uh, after the, uh, the Greek colonels or after Pinochet, after the military in Brazil, there was a tacit arrangement whereby the, the old order recognized the right of the new order to shape things differently, democratically, and the new order acknowledged that the old order would not be pursued into, uh, into oblivion. Thank you very much. You're watching Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Mr. Kinsman, in the book, you make it very clear that democracy cannot be imposed on another country, and I think the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have demonstrated that. Yet at the same time, you see a very strong role for diplomats in helping the democratic process. And in fact, the analogy that is used is, is essentially that there's a toolbox that's available to diplomats to help strengthen democracy. What are the tools available to diplomats who are stationed abroad? First, Andrew, I'd say there's been a huge change in the landscape of democracy development that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the dynamic uh, component of society uh, is increasingly uh, civil society. Uh, and diplomats accredited, sent to a country, diplomats from a, a democracy sent to a country, are in that country accredited to the authorities of the country. But increasingly, they're virtually accredited to the people of the country. We, over time, have learned that we've paid far too much attention to state-to-state -state relations and not enough attention to, to the thinking and aspirations of people within those states. 
And, and that, uh, more than anything, explains how uh, democracies are always surprised when events happen like Tunisia or, or the anti-Mubarak movement in, in Egypt. I mean, we'd over-invested in those regimes, thinking that they represented stability, and they didn't. They were unstable. Ultimately, your fundamental long-term investment is in people, is in the public. And hence, democracy uh, has, has made democratic diplomats become public diplomats because we represent our own civil society as much as theirs. We're trying to help one bridge to the other. Of course, there are a lot of direct things uh, that uh, diplomats can do to support civil society and uh, to the extent that they can uh, reconcile this with uh, often uh, negative uh, host authorities. They can uh, give direct support to, uh, to activists, to, uh, to NGOs. Uh, increasingly, uh, that's frowned upon uh, to, in the sense that they appear to be interfering in the political process. They must be terribly careful not to be picking winners and losers. They're essentially supporting a democratic process. Uh, and very often now, uh, embassies and diplomats uh, s support civil society that is helping to empower people. People in uh, helping to empower gender equality or uh, environmental sustainability or something at the hard end, soup kitchens or centers for battered women. Um, all of these things uh, administered in civil society by the people themselves. And so uh, the pursuit of those uh, organizations is toward an outcome that works for gender equality or for uh, the environment. But it also works to help to empower those people, to give them the capacity to work with other people. And inherently, if you transfer that to a post dictatorial situation, these are the lessons that people have to learn to be able to run a democracy. And, and to the extent that they didn't exist because Gaddafi didn't permit it in Libya, the Libyans, the poor Libyans, don't have that capacity, a capacity for give and take, for trust, for those uh, zones of self-management in a complex pluralistic society. So all of these things are stuff we're, we're trying to do. I think what has become apparent is, as I said earlier, is that the impulse to, for people to, to have agency, to, to have influence, is, is becoming more important than the surrounding context of, of, of process. It used to be that uh, democracy support was devoted to shoring up institutions. Um, you know, let's teach the Russians how to administer fairly a customs organization or something. Uh, today, uh, the support for agency is overcoming the support for process. Thank you so much. You're watching Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. I'd like to build on our discussion of civil society and the importance of a vibrant and open civil society within, trans within all democracies, but particularly for countries in transition to democracy. And in the book, you talk about the importance of international solidarity with civil society movements. I wonder if you could um, share some thoughts on this topic. I think uh, solidarity of civil society, of course, democratic governments are supportive of uh, civil society abroad, and uh, uh, diplomats ought to uh, represent their own civil society, uh, and to, uh, just as they represent uh, Canadian diplomats, represent Canadian businesses and their interests. But really, the connections, Andrew, are civil society to civil society. Uh, the great uh, international uh, humanitarian NGOs, uh, you used to work for Amnesty, 
but you know, uh, Human Rights Watch, uh, International Crisis Group, uh, all of those, and then the ones that uh, deliver programs, Transparency International, uh, are there and are very, very supportive of what's going on. Various aspects of civil society in our country, uh, uh, bar associations, uh, independent media, are supportive uh, of specific projects abroad. Um, so w w there is that dynamic going on. Uh, a lot of it is uh, individually driven, uh, just as uh, media has turned increasingly to, to a proliferation of blogs. So people in civil society are uh, turning uh, to an enormous uh, cornucopia of contacts out there and uh, reaching out and, uh, and international support groups. Um, like uh, ectoplasms, I mean, they increase, they contract, they increase, they contract, they extend. Uh, so, you know, uh, and it applies to campuses. Uh, one of our case studies early on was on Burma. And uh, it was astonishing doing that, to realize that the Burmese dissident or activist uh, refugees, in effect, who had crossed the Thai border and were living in these camps. One, they knew exactly what our norms are. Okay, they, they knew and they know what to uh, aspire to in Burma in their own terms. It's not a translation of our stuff to them, but they know what norms are. Two, one of the reasons they know that, I was amazed at the extent of their contacts with innumerable North American campuses, campus organizations. And uh, I see that at Berkeley all the time. I mean, I will walk down uh, Sproul Plaza, where all sort of there are booths, and I'll see solidarity group after solidarity group after solidarity group. And so people are connected, and that's happening in civil society. I think Diplomats and embassies from democratic countries could simply say, well, it's happening. Um, you know, it doesn't concern us, but it, it concerns them deeply. Because what is happening, in effect, is the consolidation of values that they, their societies represent. Old-fashioned diplomats hate the introduction of the word value into this discussion. It, it discomforts them, but it's really necessary, and values have to be reconciled with interests. You can do both. You have to do both. In fact, if you do them well, a strategic partnership with China or with Russia is going to enable you, if that partnership is based on mutual interests and conducted professionally, to have a dialogue that's meaningful on Chinese treatment of human rights defenders. It's not your country. You can't tell them what to do about their citizens, but you can tell them about the impact that has on your ability to conduct the strategic partnership because of the reaction of your own citizens. And you can tell them about what you think about how their behavior is reconciled or not with the covenants that they have all signed internationally, which commit them to a certain standard of behavior. And you can have that dialogue, but, uh, but it's, it's a balance. And, and how is uh, nonviolent conflict or the support of nonviolent conflict so uh, fit into this, this process? Well, nonviolent uh, non means are absolutely uh, the preferred and overwhelmingly statistically uh, more likely to be successful means to uh, overthrowing an authoritarian regime. I mean, an authoritarian regime can always outviolence the, the uh the usurpers. Uh, and studies have shown the uh, center, International Center in Nonviolent Conflict, with which I'm associated, um, has shown that, uh, that nonviolent means uh, succeed two and a half times more frequently than violence, and uh, in one third the time, average of three years rather than nine years. Uh, moreover, uh, they incubate all of the features of capacity building. Uh, empowerment, uh, tolerance, inclusivity, pluralism uh, that are going to be necessary in Chapter 2 once 
you the morning after the dictator's gone. Whereas violent means don't do that. They divide societies. They make it very hard. They fracture them very hard to put them back together. Thank you very much. You're watching Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. I'd like to finish off the interview by talking about some of the case studies in your book. And they all deal with very difficult transitions uh, to democracy, some are, of which are, are still in progress. And I'd like to get your thoughts. Is the world becoming more democratic? Or, as you mentioned earlier in the interview, are we seeing signs of, of backsliding? And if so, what are the forces that are contributing to this backsliding or to the advancement of democracy globally? You know, I wish I could be absolutely categoric and say, yes, it's more democratic, Andrew. It's going to be, it's all going to work out. I actually think it is, but it's going to take time. Our case studies, uh, we chose to use case studies because no two situations are the same. Each development, each country, each trajectory toward democracy is going to be sui generis, depending on the history, the culture, the geography, the preparedness of the country in question. There's no template. Uh, there's no single model. They're not something we totally understood in the early 90s. Um, they have to do it themselves. Democracy can't be exported or imported. It's got to emerge from the people themselves. So we take these different case studies to try to show how it has happened in different countries uh, in the hope, the expectation, that people who are observing this can then situate their situation uh, more or less closely to certain aspects of another situation. And uh, as we, the project moved on, my co-writer, Kurt Bassiner, and I, uh, working as we do uh, through workshops with scholars, with think tanks, and uh, with universities, uh, felt a need also to try to be as normative as possible on what works and what does not work. Uh, we did the popular uh, old faves uh, to begin with, successful uh, experiences, uh, certainly South Africa, and certainly getting rid of uh, Pinochet in Chile. And we took on uh, some of the very unpopular uh, governments uh, such as uh, Belarus, for example, Europe's last dictator. Um, and in a second phase, uh, we uh, attacked some of the difficult ones. This was Egypt just uh, four years ago. We had a, a, quite a bevy of, uh, of NGOs and uh, scholars doing that. Uh, we did Cuba. We did China, which was very uh, controversial. Uh, and in the most uh, recent uh, edition, we did the Arab Spring as seen through the lens of the original Tunisian experience, but with a view to its radiation elsewhere. And I did a very long study on Russia, which took a good couple of years, um, in a country I know very well, of course, but uh, and which objectively is completely understandable because Russia is not just the most important country to move off what was deep totalitarianism. Uh, it is, and a country uh, which held the world in the throes of the Cold War for so long, the stakes were so high. It's a country which in the late 80s was uh, experiencing almost euphoria about new freedoms. And it went sour. It went sour because it didn't work, because the techniques that were chosen were too accelerated, because they weren't based on empirical evidence of what would work. There was, there was no template. There was no uh, experience remotely similar to Russia's. Uh, they were coming from farther, aspiring to go farther with a complexity societally and economically that was simply without precedent. And no one knew what advice to give. We gave advice. But it was bad, by and large. It was to look at us. We're in the norm givers. Do what we do. But of course, you can't do that. They have to. It takes 
decades to get there. Havel said about Russia, it's going to take them 50 to 100 years. And uh, I don't know if that's true, but uh, democracy development is behavioral. It's not a process you can download. It's not an app. Uh, and you can't project it as a process. It has to be experienced, learned, and perfected. And, uh, you know, I remember uh, Saad uh, uh, Eden uh, uh, Ibrahim, who ran uh, against Mubarak to be president of uh, Egypt uh, some years ago and uh, went to jail and was tortured for his, uh, his efforts and then eventually uh, got to the United States. But I remember him saying at a conference we did about a year ago, he said, for God's sake, you gave Mubarak 30 years. Would you give us, give Egypt one year? Well, I think it's going to be a few years, but, uh, but the point's fair. The point's fair. It takes time. And these case studies are meant to demonstrate that. And they're meant to demonstrate how the time can be put to best use, both before a transition and then after a transition. And you asked, what can developed countries do? Well, they've got to hang in there. You know, we supported free elections in countries, I remember, uh, in Sierra Leone at one point. And then the election was held, and developed countries just walked away. Well, you know, they've had an election. There it is. It's all done now. And, of course, it fell apart. It's got to be sustained because democracies, and particularly young democracies, they have to deliver. What do they have to deliver? Well, uh, uh, Amartya Sen would say they've got to deliver economically, because uh, uh, economic security and democracy are interchangeable. I mean, they, they are uh, mutually uh, reinforcing and necessary, but they've got to deliver safety. They have to deliver security. Above all, they have to deliver fairness. And that's what's absent in the perception of people in the countries I've visited in Central and Eastern Europe and in Russia. Navalny's people are in the streets of Moscow because of a lack of fairness, a lack of transparency, because there are insiders who are doing deals at the expense of citizens. And we know we do have uh, international uh, organizations with codes of conduct that can, to some extent, deal with such things as corruption, as uh, lack of transparency. And we've got to be activist in them. We've also got to perform and do them ourselves because there is an exemplary feature here. If American democracy is uh, visibly dysfunctional and if people are protesting it, not on the grounds of who's in and who's out, but on its uh, very uh, authenticity, the same as in Europe, its inclusivity, then how in the world can we get off preaching to others that the success of democracy relies on inclusivity and, and managing pluralism? Well, thank you very much. Our guest today has been Jeremy Kinsman. He is the co-author of a new book, A Diplomat's Handbook for Democracy Development Support. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. Please join us again on Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. You can look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Thank you.